Hello, everyone, and thank you for being with us here tonight. Um, so before we begin, I would like to take this opportunity to make an acknowledgement regarding the land on which sits San Francisco State University, as well as the Poetry Center and the infrastructure surround surrounding us in the San Francisco Bay Area region. As we continue to benefit from the unceded land of the Olani people, it is our job to educate ourselves on our surroundings and find the truth buried under the false histories written toward the erasure of indigenous people everywhere. Let it be a call for accountability of the institutions and of ourselves. Thank you. Uh, so my name is Carlos Quinteros III and the Poetry Center is delighted to announce the first reading of our new voice series. It is an annual reading series that pairs a poet alum of SF State, Dan Lau in this case, a current SF State graduate student, poet and creative writing, uh, Edward, uh, um, Edward Gnawin, and a current undergraduate student, poet at SF State, Carlos Osoria, to each read their work and engage in conversation. 
Brent Jensen, Trayvon Roach Carter, um, and I had the pleasure to read and select from some great work from our poets and cannot be more excited for the lineup we have today. So please, after their introduction, let our poets know in the chat how fortunate we are to have them here with us tonight. The Poetry Center would also like to thank Debbie Thompson for cap uh, captioning the event. So let's begin. First up to read, Carlos Osoria is a trans indigenous feminist activist. Their pronouns are they, her, or she, her, they, them. Much of their field work and research is centered around sex, gender, sexuality, and ethnic studies. However, literary studies aren't far from their scope either, as they also research lost queer and trans representations within literature. They have written for the ANA, a quarterly arts magazine. Currently, they are on, on a path to receive their BA in comparative and world literature and American Indian studies with a minor in queer ethnic studies. Community building, gossiping, and buying unneeded books are their favorite pastimes. Please give a much deserved welcome to Carlos Osoria. Hi, everyone. Um, it's so nice to see everyone. And before I begin my presentation, I would like to give a land acknowledgement to the land that I currently occupy. Um, as Carlos mentioned, it, although this is a digital time, these issues are still very prevalent in regards to what colonial institutions and occupants and settlers occupy uh, indigenous land. So for that, I would like to give a land acknowledgement to the Tachi Yoka, and they are part of the Yoka Nation, which span what is now considered uh, the Central Valley and the San Joaquin Valley. And I would like to thank them and their ancestors for the work that they have done in preserving the land and, uh, and providing um, colonial pedagogical systems of oppression. Um, and with that, I will begin my uh, first poem, which is A Cup of Water. A Cup of Water. Cupping my thighs in the shower, I poured a cup of water from my crotch, closed thighs for an albution. Cleanse, pure, clean. Cupping my orifice in the shower, I gushed a cup of clear water from my anus for his satisfaction. Clean, silk, soft. Cupping my eyes in the shower, I streamed a cup of tears from my pale hazel eyes down the drain out of my mind, soft, fragile, cold. Cupping my perky breasts and gut, I scooped a cup of malaise from my empty gut, tossed it out of his car window, cold, fresh, warm. Cupping my heart in his hand, I streamed a cup of arrows from my heart for his infatuation, warm, slow, fast, hard, Cupping my breast and gut, I scooped a cup of shards from my broken heart, gutted from his withdrawal once again. Hard, weak, disgust. Cupping my body, I streamed a cup of anguish from my sore muscles. I cried and prayed all night. Disgust, courage, craze. Cupping my soul, I poured a cup of water on the second night crouching to place a cup of water under my bed. Craze, fragility, ease. The next poem I'll be reading is The Tears of Love. Um, like Icarus, I fall, descending through every cloud, sharp, brittle, no longer soft and velvety. Each scratch and prick rarefy your oaths and admirations, darkening the sludgy bruises on my petal flesh. I can't stop falling. Why did you he why did you sear my precious wings? Am I too vulgar for you? Am I not woman enough for you? Would I humiliate you with my cracked voice and Adam's apple? Would every one of my divine feathers you cast into a flame created by your levacious desires? I am left with an aqueous wax and I plummet. The smell of your potent infatuation, yet your comforting smile lingers within the hardening wax. Why am I stuck and conflicted with you? I am losing my mind. I feel smothered. Your silence and dishonesty throttles the 
very lungs that nurtured the flowers your words planted, cut and scrapes, uh, cut and scrapes, dribble crimson blood around my body, infused with the hardening wax. A bloodstained cocoon is made to mend my violated body. Impact. As I collide with the ocean, my wax cocoon shattered. The lights seem distant. The pain is too overwhelming, but I can't stop thinking of you. Slowly, I sink deeper. The briny water and blood fill my lungs. The flowers are slowly dying. As I, embrace, as I am embraced by the ocean, I become consumed. I let one last cry to, out, to unchain my sorrow. I can no longer feel my body the same. I hate and still love you, but now my heart is armored. My third poem that I'll be reading is A Resurrected Heart. I find myself slowly, but surely dissolving into solitude. The plucks and pricks of Orpheus' as strings harmonize, converging, uh, converging unanimously to evoke a sense of catharsis unlike any other. These instrumental vibrations are embodiments of internal screams, profusely exceeding every threshold established, repeatedly suppressed to an intolerable extent. They shatter the boundaries and borders made to protect. Tears that trickle liberate my silent screams until a silence overwhelms the composer, releasing a banshee, a banshee shriek. I lament and weep, gush my eyes and heart out, hemorrhaging thick ribbons of blood out of my teardrops. I have fallen deep into an abyss. It opens for me when Orpheus' strings harmonize. My body and heart ache as the abyss tries to mend my heart, wailing and weeping, screaming to drown out my solitude. When Orpheus plucks the cords, his frequency undoes my heart. I plunge deep to nurture my cactus heart, to allow its woes to be heard, to despine. But consciousness returns with its lantern, quickly as if frightened of its screams. Consciousness basks my heart in a light to subdue me as I dissolve into solitude. And yeah, that is my last poem. Oh, thank you so much, Carlos. That was beautiful. And yeah, you uh, chat also. Make sure to read the chat as everyone's praising you. That was awesome. So as we continue, our next reader, Edward Gunawan, a queer immigrant from Indonesia and of Chinese her heritage. Edward is a writer and interdisciplinary storyteller whose essay has been published in an Asian LGBTQ anthology, Intimate Strangers by Signal Light Press, and has had, film, and has had films screened in international film festivals, such as Berlin, Lorcano, and Clermont Fer uh, Ferrand. He is also the creator of the award-winning webcomic Press Play, which was published as a chapbook by Sweet Lit in 2020. Now based in Oakland, he is pursuing his MFA in creative writing at San Francisco State University with the support of the Marcus Recruitment Award. Visit adword.com to learn more. Please welcome Edward Ganawan. Hi, thank you, Carlos, for the introduction. And thank you, Poetry Center, for having me. I also want to acknowledge and show my gratitude uh, for the people of Ohlone as well, whose land I'm speaking on today, from today, uh, also known as Oakland. So today uh, I'll be showing three pieces, sharing three pieces. The first one actually will take the form of a Sina poem. As Ma Carlos mentioned earlier, I am also a filmmaker. So I am going to share my screen. So I'm going to, sorry for the, a little bit of the technical delay. Okay. 
Sorry, one minute. <laughs> there it is. Let me know whether you guys can see it. The door is locked, windows shut. The days and nights blend into weeks and months in a series of boxes. Soil takeouts pile on kitchen countertop as half open deliveries line the hallway and frozen screens crackle with static stutters and a dream of water. Fires rage and ashes rain down, a mask and visible walls to protect ourselves. I hear the lapping waves call my name, palm trees swaying, sand underneath my feet, salty sweat on the tip of my tongue as I dream of water. The earth parched and the sky a sci-fi yellow, diving into the deep blue Swimming with fishes and turtles, fingers pruning the chill in my bones, I listen to my own breath on the respirator, a Darth Vader resp. I am in the water. May the rain wash the sticky suit clean, the rivers and lakes quench this dusty desert, and the ocean fill me up whole. Housebound. I sit here and I dream of water. All right, and we're back. Uh, for the next piece, uh, I'm going to be reading. It's called Chronology, Chronology of Chlorine. When I smell that smell, I'm there again. Throat dry, arms raised, knees bent, butt clenched, privates tucked, snuck in the slinky safety of my speedos. The nakedness of my teenage body for all to see. Feet at the edge of the platform, alert, poised, ready. The horn blares, and I leap. When I smell that, my father's head bobs up and down, in and out, on the other edge of the pool. We come here almost every morning in the summer, it's the only activity we do together, yet he is in his lane and I'm in mine next to him. I paddle fast and reach the end before him, and not because he is letting me this time. When I am one of the boys again, stripping under the showers, amidst the echoing chatter and chuckles, who's the better kisser and which girl gives the best head? I turn and he looks at me, looking at him. I didn't turn away, I couldn't look away. He is only a year older, but taller than all of us, holding court, proud, hair clinging all around his thighs, inviting me, taunting me to look at him, taking him all in, drinking my fill. He seems to know why I am here, why I'm on this team before I even know myself, before I know it's okay to talk about other things other than girls, before I know whether I want to be him or want to be with him. When the rhythmic splish, splash, one breath over another as I kick, as I pull, as I glide between weight and weightlessness, a part of and parting the water, I am wrapped in her embrace, every square inch, every crevice. I'm once again washed clean. The next one is called Dear Future X. One night, you will bump into me on a crowded dance floor, 
cobwebs of laser lights atop the sticky swarm of shirtless men. Eyes rolling to the back of our sockets, rippling abs glistening amidst the throb, a throb, throb, and the thump, a thump, thump. You with your boyfriend and I with mine, we dance the four of us in a tight circle, chest to chest, breath streaming our cheeks, palms snuck in the back pockets of soaking jeans. You lean on me and whisper, he's a keeper. I tilt my head and grin, so is yours. We shuffle out into the patio, our boyfriends making small talks. Behind us, the door opens and closes, the throb, a throb, throb, and the thumb, a thumb, thumb, drifting in and out, the smoke of our cigarettes. You look good. I'm glad he makes you happy. I squeeze your thigh, the same one I know so well, yours in a flash of running and running, falling and stumbling, trying to catch up. I take a drag and leave the club shortly with a boyfriend. We will break up in a few months and you will break up with yours too. But you stay and you play till the lights come up, till the sun rises, till the throb, a throb, throb, and the thumb, a thumb, thumb, and the man there no longer. Thank you. Thank you, Edward. Thank you for that. That was fantastic. I really appreciate that. And next up, we have Dan Lau. Dan Lau, Akutaman, William, Dickey, and Kustra Fellow. Dan Lau has received grants and awards from the GAPA Foundation, APICC, Queer Cultural Center, Browning Society of San Francisco, and the Fine Arts Work Center in Provincetown. He has accepted residencies at Caldera, Show Us Your Spines, a, a Radar Archives Residency, Willapa Bay Air, and, and a Blue Mountain Center. He holds a BA from CUNY Hunter College, an MA from San Francisco State University, where he was the 2012 San Francisco University Creative Writing Department Distinguished MA Graduate Honoree, and an MFA in Poetry from Boise State University. Since 2012, Lau has worked in different capacities in grassroots fundraising. Currently, he serves his community as the managing poetry editor at the award-winning Bay Area-based literary journal, Foglifter, and as, and as the development director of, Kudim, of Kudiman, a national nonprofit organization dedicated to nurturing generations of writers and readers of Asian American literature. So please give a warm welcome to Dan Lau. I love your snapping, Carlos. It's just really wonderful. Um, thank you so much for having me. Um, it's really a pleasure to um, be in community with, um, you know, the line of talent that is coming out of our, our program, right? Because it's our program. And um, to see, you know, undergrads and graduates and myself who is like somewhere else, you know, who knows? Um, it's, it's, it's just beautiful to see that, um, you know, our work all speaks toward each, each other. Um, thank you for curating. Um, when Steve and Carlos reached out about this, uh, this program that they're starting, um, I was really interested in how they're creating the, the, the opportunity for for community members to return. And uh, I think that that is a really, really special thing. Um, yeah, um, I'm dialing in as this is all new to, again. Yeah, I'm dialing in from uh, San Francisco, Ohlone uh, Uremaitush land. And uh, I do want to acknowledge that. Um, I, I get confused sometimes. This is why I need like live audiences. But um, <laughs> um, 
I guess I'll go ahead and start reading. So uh, uh, I have a few poems. Feel free to like Midnight at the Apollo, Savion Glover, my, 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 myself off stage if I go too long. Um, but the first poem actually <laughs> responds really well to um, Edward's poem. It, uh, and I wrote it, uh, I wrote it when I was at SF State and uh, I was younger going to the bars uh, and I read Terence Hayes' poem at Pegasus, which is a poem that situates Oh, thanks, Steve. <laughs> this is also something new. Like you can get messages from the programmer. Um, so Terence Hayes Hayes' poem at Pegasus, which was a poem that um, detailed like the beauty of like a gay bar, right, in like Pittsburgh. And um, I'm I'm sadder than him. So this is called At Lookout, and um, here goes At Lookout. Men's knees convulse as if buckling from the weight of music. This is not the Pegasus. This is San Francisco. The tenderness of evening is lost in the afternoon. It's Sunday, but still those knees bend and buck like a crush of newborn deer freshly dropped from the womb. And I think to myself, this is what calves do, test their legs fumble over mounds of hay, stumble into crag and divot, and though time has passed, the hooves of yearlings lead with caution. Even the heart's leap is uncertain to land on solid ground. And so I watch these fawns dance. I watch them sway, delighted they nod and stretch their necks and cosset their neighbors in coarse movements with loose limbs. Um, so that's my first poem. And, uh, and then I went to Boise. <laughs> and Boise was a very interesting experience. Um, it really um, opened my eyes in a lot of different ways. I've always been from the coast, you know? And so um, having a very interior experience, meaning um, like uh, uh, like living inside the American interior was very different. And so I was thinking about like myself as a body and myself as a screen and how people have, have and always, but particularly, um, you know, projected their, their ideas and their feelings on, on the screen of you know, what humans look like and what they imagine into you. And so a lot of my work that came out of that from 2015 to 2018 come from that space. So it's a little context. Um, this poem is called An Ecology. An Ecology, crystallized. The array suspended by string within this hollowness, this rattling, this clinking, rolling over each other like waves against my perimeter. How awesome it is to echo and know my sounds, the sounds wholly my own, like hewing amethyst purposeful to the space it occupies. My red, my ribbons swimming about the geode of experience. My fugue chimes fire back and forth. Sometimes consonance gets the best of me. I folding eggs in a batter of someone else's mess. Untangle it. All these stones in silent proximity waiting to ring out as a bell's song, a chorus in a moving room no one wants to hear. A body constructed by a world that simply wants to reclaim its parts. Reader as fugue. Only through forcing can we understand sound. Moving through constriction, can we attempt to study the fluid, air, the loose collection, molecules folding over each other like sand or gumballs 
running past the thin membrane grass provides. The repurposing is a music like the way children play in fall leaves, their lines fashioning an aria, a symphony in C, how they cleave through a field to the foot of a maple just to rip the wings from the Samara clean off, to peel apart what's present and find in their hands a new thing, to see the process as creative, the infinite restructuring, the method of finding and refining the violence of a thud peeled into a machine. And so they smack the shell of a decaying log in order to find a drum, knowing to make something beautiful, you must cleave it or beat it into shape. Molt. So yes, a lot of concepts, right? Um, <laughs> Molt uh, is actually the poem that y'all um, brought up to me. So I thought I'd read it. It was also um, a moment in Boise when I was sitting by like the purple light of a television or not a television, it was a computer. Right. And um, just imagining like this concept of body, the concept of like containment and um, what, what, what it means to, to be a body. Like it's so strange, right? Like we just like ha have feelings and we're in a bag of flesh, right? It's fascinating, but uh, this is called molt. The ox cord lays its neck on the table. The nylon gym bag does its last shift on the chair. This is the sound of everything softening into the night. One dry purple bloom decides to relinquish its tie to the orchid stem. The latest piece of meat turns in the belly and whimpers its last high whimper until it's transformed into something different come morning. Another swig of kombucha, and it'll sound even less. Every day, another dull sound echoes from an empty corner of the flat. Another piece of material refuses to sustain its own weight. The French pin in the kitchen finds a new position by the potatoes. The body, body notices these simple transitions and grows jealous of the ease of transformation. The body, the only thing in constant motion, yet still the most constant. It sees the deer, the hawk, the fish on the television all change and be changed one from the other, one to the other. It watches the phantom breath of a fish anew in the bear the rabbit shiver in the clutches of the hawk and the deer belly full of wild greens and neck stretched smooth like poplar trunks and the body, the body sallow weighted in repose responds to the dark of transition within the neat comely room and calls to the blinking television with wide eyes, please, God, gut me and make me new. I have two more poems. Um, this last poem was actually created during our staff retreat for Boglifter. We went up to Sea Ranch to learn more about um, how we want to be, you know, because a lot of this work is like understanding what you want to dream about with your community and how do you want to, you know, be better? How do you want to grow better? How do we want to continue to cultivate our creative selves, right? Um, yes, Kimberly, cocoon, just like wax cocoon from Carlos's work. Um, and so um, this poem was from a uh, exercise that uh, Lisa Jesse Galloway 
gave us um, and they pulled a card and from from the tarot deck because you know if you're a poet you need to have a tarot deck right these days um so it was uh judgment you know xx judgment so this is the name of the poem in a graveyard pluto issues out its banner stark with god's red cross telling me what i already know from now on depths and love now have measure a hard candy for every time i punched my brother a soured apple for every missed dinner at my mother's table a ray of night cuts through the light and i'm alone again in a bed ever shrinking to the size i allow myself i eat the apples and pucker further into my bound shape i crack the hard candies that glue themselves to my crowns a bitter nourishment weighs in my belly while everything i've done now curdles the price of action all my solace unravels as a feast and my last poem is uh, after Aspasia in the marketplace. And uh, so in Boise, I did a lot of rhetoric. Like I was, I, was, I was working in the rhetoric department a lot because I just found it fascinating. And I came upon um, this medic that um, was a woman who was a, you know, Eastern rhetor from like Melitis, like closer to like I, around like Turkey where it is modern day. And um, she rose in power in, in a Greece, Grecian state and they hated her. <laughs> Everybody hated her and nothing was ever recorded. We don't have anything written about, written directly from her, but we have a lot of men talking about um, and talking through her. Like people used to make fun of her in their writing. And so, um, I really um, resonated to like this shape, this like negative body in space and history during that time. And so I wrote poems toward that. So this one's, this one's called After Aspasia in the Marketplace. My body meanders the path and passes the bolts of silk, the pattern maker, sweets drizzled in honey as coins exchanges exchange for coins and my arms grow heavy and they see me as they see themselves the shifting location of potential an opaque case wrapped in cloth they hear me and i remain faceless they see me and they know nothing here i thumb this orange to know its flesh i cut it open to see its red i turn my eyes up from this whole thing and split my mouth to give them my face. I let them know that this body can smile. I let them know it can tear into a stake. Thank you so much, Poetry Center, Steve, Elise, um, the whole team, Carlos, Molly, Brent, uh, Trey. Who else is there? Is anybody else there? No, I think that's it, but I just want to give you your snaps too, of course. Thank you, Dan. That was profound. That was incredible. Thank you so much for that reading. Now we could have everybody come on and we could have a nice conversation. See if any of you have any questions for each other. Um, before we take answers from the audience or myself. Um, do you all have anything to say to one another or any questions? Oh, Dan is not, okay. Um, so if I could begin, uh, something that I was really intrigued by and if I could draw a parallel between Dan's and I's work, Dan in my work, would be the transformation in character, um, but also in time. 
uh, Dan visited different time periods within his life, within his poetry. And I think that's amazing because um, usually a lot of our work portrays the growth within our sense of self and then our uh, empathy, our sympathy, our rationality. Um, and with that, I, I wrote my poems, which are in the process of going through um, a breakup and going through the process of lamenting, but also um, of restoring one's sense of self um, through it. But yes, it's, it's nice to know that these struggles aren't just mine, but they are uh, parallel to others as well. Mm. Yeah. And uh, I, well, I do have a question from Trey. How does queer identity and poetry on the body uh, um, interact and intersect? Do you want to take my class, Trey? No. <laughs> Kidding. I don't. I don't really teach right now. Um, I'm sure we could all weigh in on that. Right, Ed, Edward? Do you want to go first? Uh, go ahead, Dad. Oh, yeah. Um, I think so. To reiterate, um, can you just float that question into the, the, the chat so that we can all like have the language there and, and review it? Because it's a huge question, right? Um, and it's just also so expansive and not limited, right? It's not limited to, to queerness, right? Um, it's, 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 a, it's an issue of embodiment, you know? Um, so I'm looking. How does queer identity and poetry on the body interact and <laughs> intersect? Um, queer identity is fascinating because it's, it's such an expansive and complex and, and sometimes contradicting like thing. Um, so I don't know. I, I think it's just like the way in which like queerness interacts with poetry, I think it, it also depends on like what you understand queer aesthetic to be, right? Like how is it, how is it moved or what is it in concert with or where does it turn away from? And I think it's it's a it's really like it, it's it's just so such a wonderful and difficult question <laughs> um, to explore. Uh, but for me, as like a person who has identified as a cis man for most of my life, and you know, now I'm just like, am I? You know, um, the, the the way that the the boundaries are so permeable within like a queer experience that we 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 claim ourselves, right? We claim these, we we make these boundaries and we adhere to them, or we walk away from them. And so, thinking about that within the realm of like concept of the body. I think there's there's a there's like a devastating nature when you don't adhere to bodiness that you have, and then also there's um, there's there's a courageous mo like like direction where you claim it all, <laughs> right? Where it's just like mine, and I don't care what you want, what you think about it, so. Um, that is my very, very short <laughs> like, response to that amazing question. Um, does anybody else want to weigh in? I'll jump in. Yeah. But yeah, I think for me, yeah, it, it is such a huge question too. Thanks, Carlos. <laughs> um, and I think for me, I think yeah, I think about displacement and dislocation. I think those are the two things that come up like immediately for me um, in terms of like queer identity and queer bodies, you know, I think because for a long time, at least in the West, um, has been like policed and regulated, right? And like a lot of other bodies as well, um, marginalized minorities. Um, and so I think when we do so much of that kind of like yeah, indirect or direct oppression, then like the body will feel it for sure. And I think that will show up on the page in that way. I think personalizing a little bit to myself, I am an immigrant from Indonesia. We are, you know, the most populous Muslim country in the world. <laughs> and so our queer rights are not very, are not as advanced as 
other places in the world, you know, to say the least. And so I think I grew up with like, yeah, feeling very detached actually uh, from my own body, um, very dissociated. And I think, um, yeah, a little bit of my process, I think for the poems that I just shared, it was like written during the pandemic last year. I haven't written poetry for a long, long time. I don't even call myself as a poet, which is why I'm very surprised to be here. Thank you, Begin Poetry Center. I feel very encouraged, but it was a long time, you know, like uh, since I, it has been a long time since I last wrote poetry, but I think during the pandemic, it, it, it prodded me to think more and more in fragments because like large narr narrative arc just doesn't make sense anymore, you know, like, and so, I think it puts me into that place where I think, you know, the pieces that I shared um, is a recollection of like a, 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 my younger self, you know, of, you know, like coming of age, growing up, wrestling with my own identity as a queer person. And yeah, I wonder why, like, you know, this pieces just showed up during this time, you know, and I think it's because like, oh, I think it's, it's a very familiar place. It's almost like my body even like went back to that place again. Um, yeah, so I think that's that's been my experience at least. Um, yeah. Oh, if I could take a jab of that immediately when um, I saw body interaction uh, with the queer identity, I thought of Juana Maria Rodriguez's um, specific book, which talks about sexual features, gestures, and other Latina longings, and she explores this idea of how queerness is. Um, kind of in a way acted upon through specific uh, performativities through like gestures that dictate how we're able to identify, but also showcase ourselves. Um, and I think this could be an extension of Judith Butler's gender trouble and idea of performativity, which has been like remarkably worked upon. But when you intersect that high theoretical concept with just its core, which would be how bodies produce a gesture and we therefore act upon them in order to present our identities. I think that that is already a poetic interaction or a poet, uh, um, an intervention. If, I, if that could be an, um, uh, a limit to which I could like expand that too. Um, and that specific limit is how, um, mm queer identities are able to shape and morph uh, their senses of identity via how they feel. And it's more than just being prescribed a specific gender or uh, a, a way of acting or being, but rather it's something that an individual develops through, uh, through time, uh, through uh, coming into being not only themselves, but in relation to other people and the land. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think it definitely influences poetry because a poetry is, or any form of artistic medium is, uh, is a representation of the, those gestures or those personalities or those performativities or those actions that we feel. Personally, for me speaking, my poetry comes from a, a, a area of longing, of, of sadness, sorrow, uh that's where I got it from mm. it, it, there is happiness but for me what main what mainly drives me is um those queer ass uh, th those queer hardships that are pretty relatable within the community and how we get them and um in relation to our body and how we're able to portray them in our poetry which we all did very differently because we talked about relationships within our poems all of us did, um, and it's very interesting um, how we um, interpret those and we act upon them. Mm -hmm. So that would be my um, answer to that type of question. No, thank you, that was a beautiful answer. And a lot of your work did have things in common. Um, there's a lot of you know, like, um, you know, intimacy and, and like fluidity. And like, for me, I wrote down, um, there's this like, there's like this, uh, it's there's like this uh this 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 delicacy um in in defiance not to put all your work in a vacuum or anything but like for me delicacy calls for care and consideration but there's also a certain force behind it right you know you picture like oh that face don't break it or something it's very delicate but there's that you know that 
force that's like oh I shouldn't break it or anything and I feel like you're all three of your po poetry and writing just really embodies that and like what that holds to the flowers Carlos as you said and Dan I saw in the chat get ready for the sadness and things like you know the flowers in there could represent you know death or you know helping someone or the flowers um die in their own way or anything so I was wondering if you could speak on that like um, dichotomy of like being delicate but at the same time like having really strong force in your work and I see that through the water especially Carl you said you write from sadness and I'm curious as to how you associate that with water as well so this I think the specific poem you taught well there um, all of my poems deal with water because mm -hmm. water is life in its basic form it is our sustenance and without it we would not be alive and it is the bridge um, it is a conversion of um, so many things that I can't really go into right now. Um, however, um, within my two poems, The Tears of Love and A Cup of Water, A Cup of Water is centered around Latin American and Mesoamerican perceptions of placing a cup of water under one's bed to relieve and trap any spirits that are intending to do any harm to the body, to corrupt it or to create some form of chaos that would rather um, in a way disorient the individual into many different ways. So my, the cup of water, the poem serves to place that, um, that object or what we wish to, or what we pray to, to help us out of the situation we're in. Uh, specifically um, as I, that specific poem involves uh, prepping myself and it's, it's, it's the reality. And I think that the uncomfortableness of it really speaks for itself because um, to do something, to like put yourself out there and to be, to violate yourself, but also to buy, to be violated um, is pretty profound. Um, and it's something that um, is, tra that can lead to like some form of traumatization. But within the second poem, The Tears of Love, I think, Although it's uh, there's fragility in petals or raindrops or teardrops, I think they're powerful. They are they they have their own weight. They have their own merit. And um, I think I mainly think of this like in relation to how colonization has impacted our perceptions of what is feminine and what is masculine. Normally, we perceive what is masculine within a colonial framework to be strong, rigid, uh, it's unfazable, it has its boundaries and its borders, and it will never be anything but that. It, it would be, as what I uh, describe it, the sharp uh, and brittle uh, pricks on the body, the slashes that construct the body. However, when we compare that with a feminine and how it's treated within a colonial perspective, which is that it's fragile, it's velvety, it's soft, it's quite, it's, it's, it's quite interesting to see those two relationships in, um, in relation to each other. But within my poem, I think water bridges those two types of uh, thinking, and then it leads to um, the suffocation of the flowers, something constructed by both parties mm. through pain and suffering. And the suffocation is um, what I can easily describe as emerging of two identities separating, mm. uh, no longer being dependent off of each other. So that dependency has been separated and what we're left with is a briny uh, sludge um, in order for us to decode what that means, whether it means like, uh, or attribute, uh, attributing it to specific characteristics or specific gestures. Um, yeah, that's what I would um, consider water in relation to um, specific elements of my poetry. Thank you. Do any, uh, Dan or Edward wanna um, address what I said? Yeah, if you remember, I could repeat it or I could find, I think there was one question I found in the audience too, as well. Whichever one you will prefer, or all three of you prefer. Um, I, I, re, yes. 
<laughs> restate, please. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So, like I said, I, um, I, felt, so much. I wow. felt like there, you know, there was definitely a, a delicate aspect in your work. But like I said, there's also force behind that. And I was one, and you balance that very well in your work. And I was wondering if you could speak more on that. Um, that's like the boiled down version because I know I said a lot more mm. of that. Because, for example, again, like Symphony in the Sea or Edward, you know, your poem on the water too, or your Sin of Poem, like, again, the oh, water's peaceful, it's fluid, but there's also a certain wrath to it, a certain danger. And as Carl said, it suffocates, you know. So I was wondering how you balance that because you do it so well in your work. I can jump in if you don't mind, then. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm so like amazed to see the motive of water and all the three pieces. Um, and also like, I'm very surprised and very happy to see like this very queer lineup, by the way. <laughs> it's like, woo. Um, I am obsessed with water as well for this pieces. Uh, I'm kind of like writing on, along that motive as well. I think one of the reasons why I'm like really um obsessed with it i think water has like all these qualities right so it, it takes on like this the liquid form which is very fluid but then there's also like the solid form mm -hmm. so it's you know statics stoic and then vapor steam um and so i think i, I, I do try to like capture those essences of those different qualities of water um and yeah like trying to like almost like mimic its form on the page. So, so sometimes it can be very frozen and very still, um, and then often, you know, more fluid and even more kind of like vapor-like, which is like just, <laughs> um, yeah, and I, and I hope that comes across. And, and... Most definitely. Dan, you want to take a shot or we can move on? <laughs> yeah, sure. I mean, like, I, I don't know. I just love the, the idea of like, fluid you know <laughs> like I know that this is very strange but it's just like like it, it, it gas at certain concentrate just because it's fluid you know like mm -hmm. and um like because a lot of the ideas that I think about are like bodiness or mm -hmm. embodiment you know like containment you know um like thinking about things that lack that is, is fascinating to me, like formlessness um, or, or things that can take form, um, take upon form, right? Like um, is, is, is really, really, I don't know. It's just like something that like, I've, it feels freeing when like embodiment feels like a trap. Um, so, <laughs> um, so I don't know, it's, it, there's, there's a lot of things that I think about when, when it, when I'm thinking about like water or fluids, or it's like they're 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 you know in the same way that everybody has already touched upon, you know, there's there's a softness to it, but you know there's also um, violence to it, and I think like the idea of like things can be so like intimate, and like the flip side is that like at what point does this intimacy become violent or mm -hmm. too close or not permissible or um, and um, so, like some things, some of, sometimes that comes out, you know, in, in my work. Yeah. But yeah. Thank you, Dan. So with so with that, it's gonna be five o'clock. So I just wanted to uh, thank everyone who joined us tonight, and please be sure to join us for our last event on Saturday, May fifteenth at twelve p.m. Pacific time. And as we close out this event, please fill out the survey that pops up when you close the Zoom window. This helps the Poetry Center receive funding so we can have more great new voice, uh, new voice series events. Um, and one last time, please give our wonderful guests another round of applause and praise for kicking off this series with their brilliance. Um, it's been such a pleasure and honor to have all three of you here on this platform with us. And unfortunately, it can't be in person um, but at the same time, the plus side of that is we have more uh, support to come in and do your wonderful work as well. So I, that's what I really appreciate. So I just want to thank 
all of you again and the audience and everyone stay safe and healthy and see you next time. Take care. Thank you.